product managers. All of a sudden, they're everywhere, and uh, I see that there's a lot of doubts and there's a lot of content that is being created around what this is. Is this a methodology? Is this a whole department? Is this just one position or a team? Or is it just a fad that is in fashion right now and it's going to fade away? Uh, how different it is from a project manager? And, and why exactly should a company have a product manager? So I believe it's useful to just go back in history and understand how exactly that position was created. So I want to take you back in history, not to the Silicon Valley though, but let's go further down uh, to before the Industrial Revolution, where people would actually uh, build things or make things on their own because just because they had the ability to do so. So if you knew how to sew uh, clothes, um, then you could wear them. And uh, if you knew how to make extra clothes and you had the proper materials and the proper time, then you can sell that to your neighbor maybe. And that's how pretty much it, it was um, until all the way until the Industrial Revolution. And when the Industrial Revolution came, of course, uh, we started producing things at scale. So machinery helped us build more stuff uh, and it also got cheaper because all of a sudden we're uh, at, we, we were using less time to build whatever it is that we needed to build. So the cost went down and all of a sudden we could sell at scale as well. We could just, okay, instead of just making one pair of shoes, we could make hundreds of pairs of shoes. And, uh, and then a lot, of, a lot more people could wear them because they could also afford them because they got cheaper. Uh, pretty cool. But then the Great Depression came, especially in the U.S. And uh, I'd, I'd rather talk about the U.S. because that's pretty much where marketing was invented. Um, the Great Depression came and all of a sudden just producing wasn't enough anymore. So you needed salespeople to just go door to door or go to the stores and say, hey, here's uh, some, some shoes. You should have those uh, um, so you could sell them to whoever uh, comes by. Um that happened until the second war. And after the war, what happened is that we had a lot of assembly lines that were getting used to build machinery or build weapons. And um, they had a lot of capacity. Uh, so we, we could use that capacity to build more stuff. And all of a sudden, the market was flooded with extra stuff. So instead of, you know, just having enough shoes for everybody to wear, we started having a lot more shoes than actually even the shoe store could carry. So you needed to convince people that your shoes were better uh, than the competitor shoes. So marketing appeared as a department that would understand exactly what the customer wanted. So they would build something that would be completely catered to the customer instead of building, just building something and say, hey, here it is, take it or leave it. So that's what marketing did. They helped uh, companies understand the, the users more and also understand the markets more and also build brands and say that shoe is better than that other shoe. That shoe will help you run faster so they could sell some uh, hard advantages and concrete advantages so people want, would want to buy them and not the competitors. So this is what happened. And I believe that it's pretty cool if we try to understand uh, how similar software history is. So here's uh, one of the pictures of the early days of software. This is Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper invented the compiler or the compiler concept. A compiler is something that gets um, a language and she invented one of the very first computer language and transforms that into the zeros and ones that it understands. So uh, back in the days of Grace Hopper, a computer was made of relays, and a relay is a mechanical piece that opens and closes. And uh, for those of you that have old elevators, you can actually hear in the machinery room of the elevator something going clack, clack. Those are relays, okay? There's, they're opening and closing, and uh, old elevators still use them. So um, what happened one time is that she wrote a code, and the code wasn't functioning very well. And she went to the computer, and she found a moth uh, preventing one of the relays from properly closing. So she removed the moth and she said, hey, I found this moth on relay number 70. And this is actually the first computer bug 
um, that was it is because of that particular moth and Grace Hopper that we call computer bugs bugs because there was an actual insect inside the computer. So you know, total pioneer, um, and you see how much craft there was. In it, there was a lot of art, and this is Margaret Hamilton, and this is uh, already in the the end of the sixties. And Margaret Hamilton was learning, uh, teaching herself how to code computers, and she was an intern at NASA. Um, and during one of the missions, of, and she was writing code for the rockets during the moon race. So when she was testing the code for Apollo 8, her daughter, four-year-old daughter, pushed the wrong button, and then the code froze. And, uh, and she was trying to figure out what happened. And then she realized, oh, okay, if somebody pushes that button when the rocket is out there in space, there's gonna, we're going to have huge problems. Uh, so she told her superiors, and, and her superiors said, and, oh, don't worry, you know, the astronauts are the most technical users ever. They are trained not to make any mistakes. And of course, you can guess what happened next. Apollo 8 was there uh, orbiting the moon. Sure enough, one of the astronauts pushes the wrong button. Uh, all the navigational data gets erased, and they cannot go back to Earth. So they needed to stay awake uh, for uh, a whole night trying to figure out how to send back the data and, and reset the computer navigational data so the astronauts wouldn't die out there. Um, it was a success. They could save uh, the mission and the astronauts. But then NASA came back to her and said, okay, what were you saying again about uh, writing software that can actually overcome errors? And then Mar Margaret Hamilton, uh, she's pretty much the mother of software engineering. Um, for those of you that do uh, that, hear about you know oh we need to do all the proper unit testing or you know uh, integrate integrated tests uh, she's pretty much uh, to blame for this and she invented a lot of the good best practices that we use in software right now so again you know this is a craft and all the that pile of papers that she's holding is the code for Apollo 11 that took the man to the moon. And uh, these are all punctured cards. And these are, she wrote the code, and then you have to go and puncture uh, zeros and for, you know, a hole is a zero or a hole is a one and vice versa uh, in a paper. And then you put that in a machinery that can read that and, and burn that into, into a proper uh, hardware. So it was pretty artsy and nobody knew what they're doing you know we were inventing this as we went along so and also it was very specific very complex tasks that only a computer could achieve so we were hiring those geniuses to just understand okay what how can we uh get a man to the moon maybe with just mechanical machinery it's gonna be too difficult so and another person uh, that's me. And uh, of course, this is very pretentious and I, I'm nowhere near the level of those ladies, but I just felt that it was a good place to present myself here. So this is my LinkedIn there if you want to uh, use the QR code. And uh, when I was a kid, I wasn't poor enough to complain, but I wasn't rich enough to have a video game. Um, but I was in a kind of a rich neighborhood. Um, so it kind of sucks because, you know, you, I had everything, but my friends had a lot more everything than I had. So they had those fancy video games and they had Ataris and, uh, later, you know, they had Nintendos and, uh, and I was there like no money to, to, to buy one. So my family, what they found in a, you know, in a store that was the eighties, by the way, it was, a um, one thing that back in Brazil where I'm from, we did that. We, it was pirated copies of uh, the ZX80. So the ZX80 is a computer that you plug to the TV um, and no colors, uh, just, you know, black and white. And it had two kilobytes of memory and it understood BASIC. So I taught myself when I was 10 years old to program in BASIC. And after that, I was programming in machine code, like assembly code in Z80. And and then, you know, I migrated to an Apple pirated clone that Brazil also had. And I taught myself assembly uh, 6502. And so I was programming video games for me and my friends in my building. So, you know, they, they had the cool games, 
but I could say, oh, but I built this one, you know. Uh, so I would only, of course, build clones of video games. And that was a problem that I wanted to solve. And I taught myself how to code. And I was teaching myself things like sprites and collision detection. And this is how my history, my story uh, in computer engineering began. After I was a computer engineer, I did a master in marketing. And then in 2007, I became a product manager in a Canadian company and never looked back. And that, that's when I really found my calling and my career. So I hope that that little story speaks to some of you out there. Um, going back to people that are way better than me, and let me get my head out of the way here. Um, code started slowly, you know, but after the 70s and especially during the 80s, started, we started having better tools to write code. And uh, so the tools were more sophisticated and, and new languages were invented all the time. So we were developing faster and, uh, and trying to solve more and more problems. And also all the companies, not only NASA or IBM, but pretty much every company started having access to developers. You know, they, all of a sudden they they were uh, available and uh, they were everywhere and we could hire them. They weren't geniuses anymore, you know, but rather, yeah, clever people. But um, you could go to a decent computer school and learn how to code and then you had a job there. You didn't need to be a scientist anymore. So it was very affordable. Um, and all of a sudden, even a bakery might have, you know, a guy creating code for them. You didn't need to be a technological company. So let's take a look at how that, how that went by. So this is the F4 jet in the 60s, and it had staggering a thousand lines of code. This is all it got. Uh, the Apollo 11, where Margaret Hamilton was there, uh, was so happy, you know, with her code. It was 40,000 lines. So... It increased 40 times in 10 years. Um, next, in, in the year 2000s already, uh, the F-35, that was the pretty much the latest jet um, that I could find documentation about, and almost 6 million lines of code in 2006. But not long after that, a measly car, a GM car, actually has 100 million lines of code. And now in 2021, we're looking at software with billions of lines of code. So things are getting more and more easy to program. And uh, you can see the difference between Apollo 11 and just a car. You can definitely just build a car with no software. Uh, you can just do something mechanic. But software is actually more manageable, easier, easier to change, uh, cheaper to produce. So, you know, we, we can talk about a scale era there in, the, in software. It became affordable. Everybody can do it. So what we started trying to answer with code is not can we do this, but rather what shall we do? Because everything can be done. Um, and of course, that brings the other question, what shall we not do? And this is the product era pretty much being born there. Um, so we needed to create a department to understand what we could or we should do with code instead of just giving requirements to uh, computer guys and say, hey, figure out how to do stuff here. Or whenever you do it, it's going to be pretty useful. Now we can do so much stuff that anything can be done that somebody has to choose and, and use the proper tools to understand, okay, what do the users really want? So... There's a few things that we need to consider uh, about how software was made back in the day and how it's evolving because it has everything to do with that new product uh, thinking. So here's the, the, the software Golden Triangle. Uh, Microsoft made that popular. So you can only choose two of the following uh, dimensions, time, cost, and scope. You can only choose two of those and the third is going to be a consequence. Okay, so it's impossible, like physically impossible for you to establish, I want that code that in, in one year and it's going to cost one million. I only have one million dollars and the scope, you know, what it does is uh, take us to Saturn and, and make us settle there. Um, it's impossible. You have to either choose the scope and then, you know, your team is going to say, yeah, for a million, 
No way, but for a hundred thousand, a hundred million, yeah, we we can do it. Or you know, in a year, no way, but in ten years, maybe we can. So you cannot really fix all three dimensions, and make sure you know your CEO uh, knows that because you know some of them maybe ignore that. But yeah, it's 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 not feasible. You have to choose only two of those dimensions. So here's what happened. Um, we're talking about an era where development was kind of expensive. So what we did is just build uh, something called requirements, which is, okay, what is exactly that we're building? Oh, there's a new build like a proper document. And then a designer will take a look at those and design all the screens. And then it goes to development where people build the code. And then you test. If the tests don't go okay, great. If they don't go okay, you, you keep developing until uh, the tester says, okay, everything is according to the requirements up there. And then, you know, you deploy the code, it's out there, people are using it, and you start just the maintenance phase. Um, what happens, what used to happen is that you had to be very accurate in your scope, because if you try to change your mind after development started, you would have to change time and cost, and nobody wanted that. So what happens is that first you fix the scope and then your team look at the scope and said, yeah, okay, we can do that uh, for X, Y, Z time and we need that number of engineers so we can build it. And uh, you need to make sure that you're not going to change the requirements. If you do, we'll have to start over and it's going to cost you uh, X, Y, Z more. Okay, that's, so that's how it happened. Nobody wanted to redo anything because those guys were expensive. Um and also, what also started changing is that in those days, you would see as a, a successful software project, if that project was delivered on time within the budget and within the requirements as they specified. Um, not anymore. You know, it doesn't, that doesn't um, mean that a project was successful anymore. I just wanted to, to let you know about a specific project that was pretty interesting the documentation that they generated, you know, the Boeing uh, 777. So scope and time, they were completely fixed. Uh, it's a it's a plane, right? Uh, you, we know about the gravity. We know about the aerodynamics. We know what keeps the plane up in the air. So there's no nothing that we ignore about writing software for the plane instruments. So we the scope is very fixed. Uh, the time, well, well we, we have to start delivering the, the planes in five years, so, you know, time was fixed. So, and there's no room for improvisation or changing anything. So that's pretty much waterfall. Um, they ended up uh, generating f around five, 4.5 million lines of code. Um, there were no product managers there, but they had 70 project, project managers. And uh, something funny happens when you have that kind of very accurate metrics of uh, productivity, if you will, is that you have a very, very low average of lines of code delivered. So one person would only deliver 80 lines of code per month on average, of course. And that happens because you cannot commit any mistakes and you have to separate a long time for you to make sure that everything is of win requirements and uh, the requirements are very, very, very complex. So programming is pretty slow. Uh, I know many of you do not program, but 80 lines of code, believe me, per month is, is pretty weird. Uh, but if you do the calculations also, you see that um, we're talking about 9 million man hours in total. And uh, even if the, the coders would earn $1 per hour, we're talking about ninety million dollars, but you know, you know, they're not earning that. Uh, they're not even earning ten dollars per hour, which would uh, uh, be a total of ninety million dollars for the project. So it's impossible for a startup to actually uh, use that methodology. We don't have that amount of money or that uh, amount of time. So we had to change. Um, how we measure success. And this is what started happening when we started uh, being able to do everything. Um, okay, let's not talk about the delivery of the project, but rather let's talk about the satisfied users. Are the users actually happy that we delivered whatever it is that we just delivered? 
um, is the business profitable because we deliver wh whatever it is? And sorry about moving my head around. Just wanted you to see the, the picture. And uh, are the teams happy that they deliver whatever it is that they built? And uh, the first, the very first point, they are satisfied users. You know, it bring it has to bring us to a, a proper reflection on what a dig digital product is, because it's very hard to know what users want. All all the time we're seeing new gadgets go out in the market. You know, a telephone would look nothing like this. Uh, 15 years ago, um, and also new types of interfaces. A touch interface was not common also 15 years ago. Uh, new social and work needs, you know, before COVID, we worked in a, in, a, in, a, in some way. And now after all the quarantine, we're adapting and we were talking and communicating to people uh, through other ways. We needed to adapt our social lives. And all of a sudden, remote work became a thing. And now we have new expectations of what we want. You know, maybe I don't want to go to a traffic jam to go to an office anymore because I do have options. Society is ever changing. We don't know yet what the internet is doing to our society. This is still very much beginning. Uh, even though you know, I've seen, I've seen the internet since I don't know the '90s probably. Um, so I, I've seen my share, but still, I, I I'm pretty sure this is still just the beginning. So turns out we know a lot more about building the Boeing 777 than building a web app. Uh, there is no certainty about how the users will react to Clubhouse or, you know, um, TikTok. Or are they keep using Facebook forever? Is this going away? We have no idea. That's, that's a proper answer. So in that kind of environment, we're still researching how the user will react, the user, sorry, will react. And also uh, developing again is feasible. If, if we find out that the users didn't like what we built, we can just do it again. It's not too expensive unless we just did like a five-year plan of development. But rather, you know what, let, let me try to build uh, quick stuff here in a month and see how the user reacts to that. So we started calling that agile. What, what is agile exactly? Uh, we fix the costs, which is pretty much the, the team size, okay, the development team size. And then the product manager, here's the guy, he prioritizes a, a, a queue, a backlog of scopes, of stories, of things that we need to build. Here's the most important thing. Here's the second most important thing, and so on. So the team will, will take a look at the stories and they say, hey, we can do the first five stories in a month, or we can do the first three stories in a, in a, in a couple of weeks. So yeah, okay, agreed, go on. And while the team is developing the stories, uh, the PM is actually working on new stories. So this is more or less how it looks like. Uh, you can see the Agile cycle, uh, uh, several flavors of that around the internet, but this is good enough for illustration. So it starts here on ideation, and uh, which is somebody's there, and that's usually the PM, the product manager, uh, somebody's researching problems. Okay, what is what problem can I solve here? Uh, what is my user complaining about? And then you know, with the design team, usually uh, you design solutions. Then you you put those solutions to the development team, and they start building those. And then there's a fourth and very very important, actually essential uh, part of the cycle, which is the measurement. You see how users react to whatever it is that you built, and uh, if you need to. Ideate again uh, if you need to recreate and uh, dump everything that you did because it didn't solve any problem. That's okay. It's part of the cycle. It is completely predicted and uh, it's not a problem. So here's the thing. Agility is not about going faster. Okay. It's about being able to quickly change direction. That's, just, that's the definition of what agility really is. So whenever somebody says, yeah, we have to adapt Agile, you're not saying that you're going to deliver more stuff. You're saying that you actually you're ready to dump more stuff because you're obsessed about learning what the users want and you are not going to stop until you learn it. So what I'm saying here is that each cycle, each complete cycle achieves two results. It's not delivering the pro, uh, a project or it's not delivering 
uh, exactly what was required, but rather, okay, we're delivering a version of the product. Let's measure this and let's understand if the user likes it. And, but you're going to have very concrete proof that it solves the problem or not. And, and two, it starts building empirical knowledge about the users. So, you know, with each version, you talk to the user again, and then you learn more about their pains and their lives and what they really need, what they really want, what they want to pay for. And all of a sudden, you start becoming an expert in the user needs. And uh, you, you keep rolling that cycle long enough, and you'll be able to, to have a lot of knowledge on how the next version is really going to be the killer version. Um, that works a lot better than just, you know, brainstorming. So the product manager is that person, you know, that person that keeps an eye out on the users and understand, okay, here's what they need. We need to build this. You know, it doesn't matter if, if, if somebody else had another idea. I'm talking to them. I understand them. They, I saw them using our thing and uh, the way that they use it. Uh, if, we, if we build that one feature, they'll probably pay even more or, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be more successful in their lives. So let's do it. Okay. Um, it's a very different position from a project manager. And notice that I'm actually talking about looking out, outside the company, you know, looking to the users and I not actually looking in, like to delivery. So that sounds fine and dandy, but some of you might be asking yourselves, okay, so actually the product manager is the guy that's going to create and recreate and maybe destroy code. Uh, how is that productive? Uh, why do you think that he helps? So let's talk about productivity really fast. Um, there is no point in being productive if you're not uh, building the right thing, right? So here's how I like to define productivity. It's not the amount of things that I, that I deliver on time, but rather the amount of valuable things that I deliver on time. So the way to actually... Uh, one of the ways that to actually understand how to be more productive is that just like Tai Chi Ono, you know, he's the Kanban inventor uh, in the Toyota assembly line. And actually he wrote a, a pretty sweet book about how Toyota does things. And uh, he says, yeah, everybody's cost, you know, there is no guru, no magic uh, developer that just because I'm here, you know, my company is profitable now. We're all cost, man hours cost money. So we need to maximize our own productivity. So actually, oh, I, I want to build, I uh, want to maximize my productivity by hiring more people. You're just making the problem worse. You're just putting more cost into your product. So uh, just remember that, you know, very wise guy. Um, so how to maximize productivity? Not more man hours, because I guarantee that your little startup with two developers, uh, you have the same problems that Google with thousands of developers have. You have more ideas than uh, you have man hours to do all of those ideas. So it's not about just buying more man hours. It's not about speeding up work. Please, you know, don't be the guy that, that tells your developers, oh, yeah, you know, you need to help me here. Maybe you, you could do some extra time. It's not going to solve anything. Um, but rather, you can prevent teams from building useless things or things that bring little value to the users. And now we're talking about something that's very, very achievable if you have knowledge about what the users really want. Okay, so this is where the PM comes in. And uh, we, we're constantly looking at the users and how they react to our product. And we're building knowledge about that market and that need. And we know how to prioritize whatever, all, all of the ideas that somebody's given uh, by value and say, okay, this has a lot of value to the users. Let's build this first. Um, and here's the change from the production era where we would just build the code because, you know, people need it to the marketing, you know, quote unquote era, uh, where we understand that just, you know, spitting out technology is not enough, but rather we need to spit out the right technology. And, you know, how difficult is that? Well, it is difficult enough that you work 40 hours a week on that. So you need to create a position just for that. Um, so if you're not using your product managers to do this, you're probably wasting, you know, part of those man hours. So ultimately, that's what we do as product managers. We're uh, in charge of making costs, which is us, our man hours, 
become profit for the company by understanding what the users want and by making our teams build exactly what the users want in due time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you like this. And um, I just wanted to ask you to get your phones and, you know, and scan that QR code. There's a little feedback form over there, only three questions. And for those of you that answered the three questions of how I went, you know, what would you would like to know or uh, things that I did wrong, uh, please don't complain too much about my accent. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing I can do about it, but there's a lot I can do about this content. Um, um, I will thank you by providing the PDF uh, after the, the little questionnaire. So I thank you for your attention. Um, I'm really, really excited to bring this content to product school and I hope to, to see you around. Bye.